After a year of scaling back youth sports to help prevent the spread of COVID, some experts fear that we've created a different health crisis in the process. When the pandemic hit, it was as if we were watching the whole nation's children having their antidepressant taken away, having their anti-anxiety medication taken away, because that is what exercise and sport is for so many people. Welcome to The Real Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Max Gershberg. You just heard an excerpt from correspondent Kavitha Davidson's new real sports story about the emotional toll that a year without sports has taken on kids in America. Since the pandemic began, most government and public health officials have decided that youth sports are just too risky. The potential spread of COVID isn't worth it. But as Kavitha's report reveals, Taking that approach has led to some unintended consequences. With games shut down, many kids who rely on sports as a healthy outlet and an essential part of their childhood have seen their mental health deteriorate in a very significant way. On today's podcast, we'll hear that full story. And with us to talk about her report is Kavitha Davidson. Kavitha, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. So as you started work on this piece, were you surprised by the trend? I mean, it's one thing to hear anecdotes from frustrated parents or kids who want to play, but were you prepared to find such a significant pattern? I would say yes and no. I think that I expected there to be some kind of effect here, right? I mean, all kids are suffering right now, whether they're athletes or not. Um, I mean, adults are suffering as well, right? Uh, But I I was definitely surprised the extent to which the problem lies and how severely some of these kids were were taking losing sports. I, I was definitely surprised to learn that. Well, if you've already seen this story, stick around because Kavitha will be back with us afterwards to dig deeper into this subject and her experience covering it. But first, here is Kavitha Davidson's new Real Sports Report. Pick a sport, any sport, and chances are someone from the ELO family plays it. Come on, Eli! Go, Eli! Go, Eli! Go, Eli! For these six kids in Northern California, it's been football, basketball, soccer, volleyball, even BMX that have packed their schedules for as long as they can remember. But after COVID hit, The ELO family's busy schedule evaporated. March of last year, the world shuts down, sports shut down. How did your kids react to that? The lack of physical activity, the lack of the team, the lack of that competitive spirit, the kids have no outlet. Allison ELO is their mother. The demotivation, the lack of any kind of enthusiasm for anything, there's a void that has to be filled. What have you been doing without soccer in the last year? Mostly just playing video games and staying in my room on my phone. While all the ELO kids struggled without sports this past year, the loss was especially tough for 12-year-old Colby, who turned to more than just video games to fill the new void in his life, something his mother discovered when she opened the liquor cabinet one day. There was barely anything left. I think there's a total of five or six bottles that were completely gone. It felt good in the moment when I was doing it, like drinking, but I just felt so much shame and guilt. He started talking to me that he was going to leave and he was going to say goodbye to everything. So I know what that meant. He said he had nothing left. He wanted to take his own life? Yeah. And he said he had thought about it and um, thought about slashing his wrist. Allison rushed Colby to the emergency room, then quickly got him into counseling. Do you make direct connections between Colby's struggles in the last year and not being able to play soccer? 100%. When he had soccer, he had that 
a sense of purpose, but more so the sense of joy in himself and the sense of confidence. And he's lost all that. As alone as Colby has felt, his painful story is just one of many from this past year, which has been an alarming development for mental health experts across the country. Experts like sports psychiatrist Dr. Claudia Reardon. When the pandemic hit, it was as if we were watching the whole nation's children having their antidepressant taken away, having their anti-anxiety medication taken away, because that is what exercise and sport is for so many people. Reardon and her colleagues at the University of Wisconsin have been studying the mental health of adolescent athletes since the pandemic began. And their research revealed that after sports shut down, depression among young athletes shot up nearly 40% from pre-pandemic levels. Taking sports away from kids, Reardon says, means taking away a whole lot more. There is something unique about sports for a significant proportion of kids. That physical activity that is so good for mind and the rest of body with social camaraderie, with an extra uh, set of adults to keep an eye on the kids to make sure they're doing okay. It's kind of an efficient way to optimize kids' mental health. It's a one-stop shop. Exactly, yes. And if you think about it, it's a really big change for athletes, especially if that athletic identity has been a big part of their life. That has really become you know, how they see themselves, how they uh, garner a sense of fulfillment and meaning in their life. And then you take that away, that's a big deal. To try and see how much sports truly contribute to the mental health of young athletes, Reardon's team conducted another study last fall. They compared kids who were able to play sports with those who could not, controlling for whether or not they also returned to in-person classes. Turns out, going back to school had little effect, unless sports came with it. What we found is those athletes who were able to go back to sport doing significantly better, way lower rates of depression, anxiety, higher quality of life, and school didn't explain it. Those findings were made strong after controlling for that issue. So the factor, the game changer here wasn't in-person school, it was sports. It was a sport issue. And as with many issues across society, the impact has been felt the hardest by those who have the least. Children in lower-income communities have seen their opportunities to play dry up more quickly and are feeling the loss of what they say they need to stay healthy in both body and mind. When I feel like I'm going through stuff personally, basketball gets my mind off of everything. What do you need from basketball? I need the competitiveness. I need the motivation. I need, I need everything. Bruciana Cook and Sky Ebron are high school students in Washington, D.C., when the pandemic began last year, their school shut down, and so did the basketball team. Then, after they tried to play outdoors at local parks, those closed down too. Courts started filling up, so they took away the rims to say that, hey, social distance. They removed the rims from the backboard. Yes. It was no court in D.C. with the rim on. When you saw there's no rim, there's no net on that backboard, what is, what's going through your mind? I was shocked. I was like, they're not making it any better by taking away something that people love. In a city governed by tight COVID restrictions, the girls were desperate for something to give. At one point, I cried to my mom, like, cried. But I was like, man, can we move somewhere? Like, can we move to Texas? You wanted to move? Yes, because I wanted to play so bad. And without having basketball, what did you do with your time? Like, after school, I go right to sleep. I stay in my room all day. My sister thought I was depressed. And I'm like, I'm not depressed. So then when I kept doing it, it made me worry that I was depressed. What did that feel like? Like I'm drowning, like I can't do nothing. I lay down, I don't move. Today, after a year of scaling back youth sports to help prevent the spread of COVID, some experts fear that we've created a different health crisis in the process. COVID is not just one public health issue. 
To me, COVID is a series of public health crises, and we can't be so uniquely focused on disease spread that we ignore the other aspects of, of health. Alex Diamond is a pediatric sports medicine physician at Vanderbilt University and has helped advise high school sports programs across the nation during the pandemic. He believes that policymakers have been too conservative in restricting youth sports. We're supposed to be a society where um, we value our children um, more than, than anything else. So I think we need to sort of come back to the middle ground and, and look at all the downstream effects that this is potentially having on our kids and teens. But the CDC just suggested that winter sports might have been the cause of an outbreak in Georgia and 49 youth sports teams in Buffalo were forced to shut down their seasons as well. Do you have concerns that reopening sports around the country could lead to outbreaks nationwide? Increased social interaction always has that potential risk. And so we need to continue to have caution. But I think the risk of not playing is greater than the risk of playing. In the worst case scenario, the risk can be to a young athlete's life. A growing number of parents now say their children lost so much hope and purpose without sports during the pandemic that it led, at least in part, to their taking their own lives. A year ago, Trevor Till was one of the best high school pole vaulters in the state of Illinois. He was set to begin his senior season as the captain of the track and field team when the pandemic struck and the season was suspended. Lisa Moore is Trevor's mother. In the beginning, it was, well, it's going to be for a week or two weeks or, you know, and it just kept going and going. Do you think he lost some of his motivation? Oh, sure. Yeah. I heard him cry sometimes at night and he quit running. He didn't run most of the summer. I kept saying, maybe you should run. You're an athlete and, you know, the endorphins and... And why do you think he, he just didn't? Didn't feel like it. Didn't see, you know, tracks over. Just didn't see the point. Moore says her son just couldn't seem to get over the loss. Last fall, Trevor left for college. In time, he became unresponsive to calls and text messages, leading his parents to worry. My ex-husband went down there to do a wellness check and they found him. It was my baby. He hung there for three days. <laughs> this boy, that was so full of life. He could have been anything and he's gone. Do you think if he had had track and field and pole vault, Trevor would still be with us? I do believe that. I do believe that. I think if he could have finished his senior year like he wanted to, he would have just continued to be the kid he was, you know? He wouldn't have lost his spark and his light. Moore said it wasn't long after the grief of losing Trevor had set in that another emotion began to surface over the state of Illinois' decision to suspend high school sports. Anger. Yeah, that makes me mad. There's so many kids that are hurting that want to be out there playing. So Moore filed a lawsuit against the governor, claiming the restrictions were unfair and unlawful. Fighting one illness, she says, shouldn't mean ignoring others. I don't want to see COVID spread. You know, I know it's real, but we're not meant to be isolated. We're meant to be together. It's a sentiment echoed by Allison Elo, whose home state of California suspended youth sports competition for most of the pandemic. That's one of the worst decisions they could have made. Are you worried about the long-term effects that this last year might have on, on Colby's well-being? I don't think I'd be a good parent if I wasn't worried about that. I don't want him to become a statistic down the line. I just think he needs to go be a kid, go play. I'm back with Kavitha Davidson. So Kavitha, that study Dr. Reardon conducted on kids returning to school with and without sports, how did she go about measuring that? And, and how is it that she's so confident that the catalyst for depression was the lack of sports? 
Well, so that 40 percent number that you heard in the piece was self-reporting. So, you know, kids themselves were were identifying the fact that they were experiencing depression at a higher level, having lost both school and sports than they were before. In another study, uh, Dr. Reardon and her colleagues at the University of Wisconsin also did control for kids who returned to in-person learning versus kids who returned to in-person learning and sports. And once those kids returned to in-person learning and and sports, they reported lower levels of depression. So that's what she used basically to base her assessment that it wasn't just losing school and it wasn't just losing classes. Sports really did make that much of a difference. You mentioned earlier, all kids are suffering through this pandemic. Is it fair to put so much on sports? I mean, would we be seeing the same phenomenon with with kids who are music lovers and haven't been able to play with the band or theater kids who can no longer be on stage? Well, as a band geek myself, it's certainly a question that I asked. Um, and and it's a fair question, uh, for sure. What what Dr. Reardon said and and what you know some of the experts that we talked to seemed to point to was one, we just don't have the data. We're not studying the loss that the kids who lost theater or band or any other extracurriculars are experiencing. But uh the hypothesis, the theory is is that you know, sports as one activity, what Dr. Reardon said, sports addresses so many aspects of mental health. It addresses the physical aspect. It addresses a lot of the mental aspect, the team building, the confidence, all in one activity. So while you might get a couple of those things from a particular extracurricular, sports really do offer everything in that one package. So the loss of it, you could understand, might be uh, might be felt more impactfully. The girls you met from D.C., Bruciana and Sky, speak to the idea that this has disproportionately impacted poorer communities. But rules are rules. So as sports have been shut down, how is it that kids from more well-to-do families have been able to play where others have not? You know, when I talked to Bruciana and Sky, they did point to the fact that they were aware that um, that girls in in the D.C. area who went to private school um, had options to play pickup games that were being organized on the side or AAU games and club games. And and the barriers there are obviously it's just expensive in general to organize those kinds of events. And then, you know, travel and, and all the logistics of actually getting there. Has the research looked at any other specific groups to see who has suffered most, you know, boys versus girls, older teens versus younger adolescents, a- anything like that? So high school seniors, um, interestingly, were affected m- much at a much higher rate. Um, and the explanation there was, you know, high school seniors are playing for more, especially if you're talking at a, at a relatively higher level. They're playing for that last state championship. They're playing in, possibly in front of scouts, you know, for for college. Um, and girls absolutely did experience depression at a much higher rate than boys did. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of reasonings behind that. One huge one, obviously, is just that girls in general, whether they're athletes or not, do report higher levels of, of depression. Um, you know, we can we can have a conversation about whether that's because they're reporting at a higher level because boys are taught to be more stoic or whether they're actually experiencing higher levels of depression. But another aspect of that is because especially at younger ages, girls self esteem is so wrapped up in their body image, losing the physical outlet, losing the thing that they really thought of as keeping them fit um, was really affecting how they viewed themselves and their self-esteem. The other expert you spoke to in the piece, Dr. Alex Diamond, says pretty plainly that the risk of playing is less than the risk of not playing. He says he has data to, to back that up. But how do we reconcile that with the continued reporting about COVID outbreaks tied to youth sports. I think that's one of the more difficult parts of this piece, frankly. Um, You know, I don't think that you need to be a COVID denier or an anti-masker to recognize that these kids are suffering and that both of those, you know, COVID itself is a is an extremely dangerous thing. And not having sports has also been dangerous to these kids. And both of those things can be true at the same time. Um, A lot of the studies have actually shown that the actual playing of sports themselves isn't what is contributing to the spread. Now, obviously, all sports are not created equal. You know, there's a difference between an indoor contact sport like wrestling and and the potential of spreading uh, the coronavirus from that versus an outdoor, you know, versus playing baseball outdoor in an open field. Um, But a lot of the data really does suggest that um, that 
the actual playing of sports isn't causing transmission. It's the team activities. It's the meals. It's all of the it's the locker room. It's all of the ancillary things that do go along with playing sports that are harder to eliminate it completely, but are easier to control for if the goal is to actually just bring back on the field play. As far as we can tell, are government officials or public health officials aware of this trend of increased depression among young athletes? Is there any indication it's being factored in as they assess reopening decisions? You know, there was a campaign in California called Let Them Play that did, I think, go nationwide that basic, that a lot of people really do feel kind of forced the hand of California Governor uh, Gavin Newsom to start to reopen some school activities, including sports. So a lot of people really do feel that not enough attention was paid to these unintended consequences, that the mental health of these kids might have been an afterthought. Um, you know, when the, the primary thought of everybody was literally just keeping people safe. But in the ensuing year, it's it's kind of an impossible consequence to ignore for these officials. You say that, but earlier this month, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer just asked for a two week pause to youth sports. And she seemed to put a lot of the issues that Michigan is having on things like youth sports. Do you fear, knowing what you know now, that as long as COVID persists, officials on the whole will continue to take that approach and kids' mental health will just be accepted as a casualty. Well, for sure. And, and you know, one of the things that we've learned in this last year with every aspect of, of COVID is that we just don't know so much. And we don't know what these new variants are going to do. We don't know what the actual um, effect of, of bringing youth sports back is going to have on transmission rates. I do think that, um, you know, we have learned a lot in the last year about how important sports are to these kids, but it is it is a very delicate balancing act that, that a lot of these officials are having to play until we fully get out of the woods and really do reach herd immunity. Lisa Moore, who tragically lost her, her son, Trevor, uh, the, the lawsuit she's bringing. Uh, tell me more about that suit. Where does it stand? And do you envision, given uh, how common this issue has become, more cases like it? So the crux of the argument of the lawsuit against uh, the governor of Illinois is that by shutting down youth sports, uh, he denied um, he denied these kids, these young athletes, their right to equal protection. Um, motions were recently filed for summary judgment, so they're awaiting uh, they're awaiting a ruling from a judge on that. Oral arguments begin on May twelfth, so it's it's going through the legal process. Um, I'm frankly not sure how successful it will be, um, what the end game there will actually turn out to be. I could see other similar lawsuits maybe popping up around the country, but you know, to be to be perfectly honest, Lisa Moore's case is so tragic um, that you could you could see how she has outsized motivation to pursue something to this level. Incredibly tragic story, but I'm sure it crossed your mind working on this piece that a lot of folks at home might question, you know, was it really sports? Was Is it fair to say that sports really played a, a key role in, in what happened to Trevor? I mean, how did you wrestle with that as you learned more and you met Lisa? I think that's a difficult question to ask any time that you're covering mental health. And you'll never truly know what motivates somebody to take their own life. And and that's that's true in this case as much as as anything else. I, I did ask Lisa, um, you know, had there been any signs that that Trevor was depressed or that he had had he had been going through mental health issues and she very adamantly said no. Now, again, Parents don't always know what's going on with their kids, especially inside their heads. Um, and there are a lot of other factors that could play a part. I mean, just the pressure of being a college freshman in itself in normal times is a lot to handle, let alone when you're isolated, let alone when you don't have sports and when the world is going through um, a pandemic. So there there could absolutely be a lot of other factors at play. Lisa was fairly adamant that it was losing sports. But I, I do think that at the very least, we can say sports. Sports, if there was if there were other things going on, sports would have helped alleviate some of that. In a time, Kavitha, when there's so much tension around public health messaging and there's pressure from people to be really as risk averse as possible when it comes to the spread of COVID, were you reluctant at all to take on this story, which does raise the counterpoints? Oh, a hundred percent. And I don't I don't want this story to serve as 
fodder for, you know, risky behavior, for not wearing masks, for not social distancing. Or, you know, I don't want people to think that the purpose of the story was to denigrate um, you know, the abundance of caution that a lot of officials have had to institute in, in their local municipalities. It's just trying to shed light on the fact that, you know, we're going to continue to unpack the effects and the consequences of COVID for months, if not years to come. And the mental health aspect is is one that that, you know, often just goes silent and uncovered. Um, and that's just one that we wanted to shed a light on. In normal times and non-COVID times, we just don't talk about youth mental health enough. And we we had started to um, in the last couple of years. And this just threw a whole other wrench in that whole discussion. Well, Kavita, it was an enlightening, but but certainly a really sad story that we'll continue to keep our eyes on. It was great to have you on the podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And Kavitha's story is just part of this month's episode of Real Sports. Also on the new show, Andrea Kramer has the story of Dave McGillivray, who you may have heard on the last episode of the podcast. McGillivray has been the race director of the Boston Marathon since 1988. But during the pandemic, he's turned his attention to overseeing a massive vaccination effort in Massachusetts. Mary Carrillo reports on the Barkley Marathons, where runners have 60 hours to complete a course that is 100 miles long and has 120,000 feet of climbs and descents. It's the most sadistic race on the planet, which is why only a handful have ever made it to the finish line. And John Frankel updates his story on backcountry skiing, a sport that's seen record growth amid the pandemic as skiers take to the open air. But more people in the backcountry mixed with dangerous snow conditions has turned this ski season into one of the deadliest years for avalanches ever. You can catch those stories and all recent episodes of Real Sports with Bryant Gumbel on HBO Max. And that'll do it for today's Real Sports podcast. I'm your host, Max Gershberg. Thank you for listening, and please join us again next time.